If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus rather than a war. We are asking the American public to work with us to prepare in the expectation that this could be bad. The sudden spike leading Italy's prime minister to take what he calls dramatic COVID measures. COVID-19 forced the prime minister to chair the emergency meeting on the pandemic via video link. From tomorrow, he'll also be communicating by letter, warning every British household the outbreak will get worse before it gets better and stricter controls may have to come into force. Nearly 1,000 people have died in the past 24 hours. 779 people have died in just the past 24 hours. We are going into a global recession. More than 2,000 coronavirus deaths in a single day. There was a warning today that it could take up to six months before life in the UK returns to normal. In December of 2019, a new type of coronavirus, now named COVID-19, was first identified in the Hubei province of China. Since that date, over three billion people, nearly half of the population of the world, have been forced into some form of government-imposed isolation. From India to the US, governments across the planet have taken extreme measures on a scale that has never been seen before. Whole nations have been put on lockdown. Schools have been closed, businesses forced to shut their doors, and normally busy streets now resemble ghost towns. Panic-stricken citizens have left supermarket shelves bare, leaving many essential items in short supply as mass hysteria spreads, and the world-changing nature of the situation begins to hit home. Despite the constant stream of reports from both governments and global media, many have been left in a state of confusion about the uncertain future that lies ahead. So what exactly is taking place? Are we really facing a worldwide pandemic that has the potential to leave millions dead in its wake? Or is there something else going on? This is a police message. You must stay indoors. This is a police message. Please. This is just the beginning. This is just an attempt to freeze everything in place. No one can deny that the frenzy surrounding this so-called pandemic has been hyped by both mainstream and independent media. You can hardly avoid the sensationalist headlines, nor the constant stream of numbers presented like some hastily ticking doomsday clock. Most of us though, not trained in the skills of statistical analysis, take these numbers at face value. But should we? To fully understand any statistics, you need to know how that data has been collected to find out what it really represents. In the UK, the most accurate fatality numbers come from the Office of National Statistics. And as of the 31st of March, they started releasing their own numbers on COVID-19 related deaths. These statistics, unlike those updated daily that use speculative reports, are taken from official death certificate information. But because of this, they can take a little longer to be released. The most recent report from the Office of National Statistics is for the week ending on the 27th of March. Here we can see that up until this date, a total of 647 deaths related to COVID-19 were recorded. And looking at them a little more closely, we can see that as many of the media outlets have been reporting, the vast majority of these fatalities have been in the elderly, with the age range 65s and over making up nearly 88% of all deaths involving the virus. It is important to note here though, that the percentage of elderly dying from this virus compared to other age groups is what you would normally expect, no matter the cause, on any given week in the UK. For example, of the total deaths recorded in the UK for the week ending on the 31st of January, over 85% were in the age group of 65s and over. 
And of course, this makes perfect sense. On any given week, we would assume that the vast majority of deaths would occur in the elderly. So is it really COVID-19 that is killing these people? Or would these deaths have been expected anyway? Another interesting piece of information provided to us by the Office of National Statistics is related to deaths caused by respiratory disease. Here we can see that the overall deaths caused by lung diseases have remained steady despite the increase in deaths involving COVID-19. Another thing to note when mentioning coronavirus deaths, the Office of National Statistics uses the phrase deaths involving COVID-19, not deaths caused by COVID-19. To understand what this means, we need to look at how the Office of National Statistics tells us it calculates these numbers. So here's what they say. Because of the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic, our regular weekly deaths release now provides a separate breakdown of the numbers of deaths involving COVID-19. That is where COVID-19 or suspected COVID-19 was mentioned anywhere on the death certificate, including in combination with other health conditions. The official statement above gives us an interesting indication that these numbers are not all they are made out to be. The fatality numbers provided by the Office of National Statistics include all deaths where COVID-19 is mentioned on the death certificate, regardless of if COVID-19 was the main cause of death or not. It also tells us that even suspected cases of COVID-19 are recorded in the official statistics. That is where COVID-19 was not even proven to be present at the time of death. This way of recording deaths related to COVID-19 is also used in the US. This much to the frustration, as we can see here, of many medical professionals. As a physician, I received an email last week from the Department of Health coaching me on how to fill out death certificates. And I've never really received coaching from the vital statistics uh, agency in terms of how to do a death certificate. But basically, I felt like they were saying, you know, you don't have to have a confirmed laboratory test for COVID-19 in order to make the death certificate be COVID-19. So with that being said, why would they want to skew the number of deaths due to COVID-19? Well, fear is a great way to control people. And I worry about that. I worry that sometimes we're so darn interested in just jazzing up the fear factor that, you know, sometimes people's ability to think for themselves is paralyzed if they're frightened enough. We define laboratory confirmed COVID-19 associated deaths as anyone who has uh, symptoms of COVID-19, test positive on a COVID-19 test before or around the time of death. We do not determine causality. This fact alone indicates that these numbers at the very best are speculative and that deaths actually caused by COVID-19 are most likely much lower. So if it's not COVID-19, then what could be responsible for all these fatalities? Well, the statement also tells us that in some cases at least, there were other underlying health issues. At this time, there is little data on these numbers in the UK, but in Italy, where COVID-19 has been active for much longer, we do have some numbers. A retrospective chart review of 355 deaths recorded in Italy where people had tested positive for COVID-19 showed that a high percentage were carrying multiple other ailments. Of the 355, only three, that is less than 1%, had no underlying medical issues and nearly 50% had three or more. 
As well as this, the study gave us some data on what these health issues were. And they were not minor health issues either. All of them are in the top 10 of the world's most deadliest diseases. And remember, nearly 50% of those who died after testing positive for COVID-19 had three or more of these illnesses. Something else to note here is the absence of underlying lung diseases, which considering coronavirus primarily affects the lungs, you would expect that most of the underlying health issues associated with COVID-19 deaths would be lung related. The importance of such information is vital and has even provoked comment from people like Professor Neil Ferguson who is director of the MRC Center for Global Infectious Disease Analysis at the Imperial College London, who stated that the proportion of COVID-19 victims that would have died anyway could be as many as a half or even two thirds. Adding such statistics and statements to the fact that in the UK and the US at least, some of these deaths related to COVID-19 are only where the patient was suspected of having the virus. The numbers being presented look highly suspicious. Given such data, we would have to at least consider that the numbers here are being deliberately inflated. And there is precedent for such things. A response article from 2018 in the British Medical Journal entitled Government Exaggerates Flu Mortality Rates Again Why Cannot the Public Be Trusted with the Truth? states that during the winter flu of 2017 to 2018 the government attributed 50,000 excess deaths for that period to the seasonal flu. Given that actual deaths caused by flu that year were around 340, that is an increase in the region of 150 times the actual number. This exaggeration came after the House of Commons was said to be shocked that flu vaccination uptake in social care settings was at best only 25%, a correlation that was noted by the British Medical Journal. There is much more we could do to put these official numbers under scrutiny, but I feel we would only be overemphasizing a point already made, that the statistics at this time are not showing evidence of a lethal pandemic. In fact, they show little evidence of anything at all. So let's take a slightly different approach. Let's assume for argument's sake that regardless of any of the information above, the actual numbers being presented at this time regarding death tolls due to COVID-19 are exactly as they are being reported. And that all government measures such as lockdowns are in direct response to these numbers. Then the question would be, is the response by governments worldwide reasonable and in line with how they would be expected to act in such a situation? The current total of deaths estimated to be caused by COVID-19 is just over 114,000 worldwide as of the 13th of April 2020. Just to put that number in perspective, 17.9 million people die annually from heart disease. So in just a single month, it would be expected that heart disease would account for just under 1.5 million deaths worldwide. Now some could put forward the argument that despite COVID-19 being active since at least late 2019 and has now spread to nearly every corner of the globe, 
we are still in the early stages of the outbreak. And as such, death tolls could be expected to rise exponentially. This has led to nearly every authority on the planet making predictions on the final death toll of the virus. The media, as is to be expected, constantly present these numbers with little to no questioning. This is despite the predictions changing daily, and in many cases differing vastly from one to another. At the end of March, the White House predicted 100 to 220,000 would die from COVID-19 in the US. Now White House officials believe that number to be closer to 60,000. But even the original prediction still pales in comparison to heart disease, for example, which in the US alone kills 650,000 annually, or even something like cancer, which claims 600,000 American lives each year. So even if we take all the numbers at face value and allow ourselves to accept the highly speculative predictions and forget comments like that of Neil Ferguson, who stated that as many as two thirds of all COVID-19 deaths may have occurred anyway, COVID-19 has a potential fatality rate only one tenth of the yearly fatality rates of heart disease or cancer. Of course, even if we accept this number of 60,000 possible deaths in the US, we are not for one second saying such a death toll would be a good thing. But it does beg the question. If the American government, like so many across the world, are willing to shut down their entire nations, costing billions and disrupting the lives of every single citizen because of COVID-19's potential to kill, why do they not act with the same zeal when facing diseases with proven fatality rates far greater? To put this into perspective, because of the mass disruption caused to daily life in the US, the Senate passed a $2 trillion aid bill to help workers and businesses cope in the lockdown. In comparison, public funding in the US for cardiovascular research is around $2 billion yearly. And Dr. Margaret Cuomo stated about cancer funding, more than 40 years after the war on cancer was declared, we have spent billions fighting the good fight. The National Cancer Institute has spent some $90 billion on research and treatment during that time. Just a reminder here too, $1 trillion is $1,000 billion. So the aid budget of $2 trillion passed by the US Senate is equivalent to over 22 times the total spending by the National Cancer Institute in over 40 years. So if the US government really cared about the health of its citizens, would it not take such drastic action against cardiovascular disease? Of course, heart disease, unlike a virus, is not contagious, but it is preventable. And we know many of its causes. For example, fast food has long been associated with heart disease. So if governments are willing to shut down entire nations because of the threat of coronavirus, would it not also be acceptable then, in the interest of preventing death, that we would at least shut down all fast food restaurants? Of course, such extreme measures would never even be suggested. And despite health concerns regarding fast food, chains like McDonald's freely operate within children's hospitals in the US. This is not the only area that seems contradictory either. The Four Nations Health HCID group 
in the UK changed the status of COVID-19 back in January to that of a high consequence infectious disease or HCID. Whilst you might imagine such a status would force the government to act, it did not. In fact, when the government announced the police enforced lockdown of the UK on the 23rd of March, the HCID status had already been removed. On the 19th of March, after over a month of observation and review, the Four Nations Health HCID group decided that the virus was not as lethal as first thought and removed this status. There are also other anomalies, such as how this epidemic seems to only be affecting, well, with any real intent at least, Western nations. And countries bordering China, with huge populations like India, seem largely unaffected. Despite all of the above, the fear train still keeps rolling. Whilst predicted death counts keep dropping, the lockdowns keep getting longer, and media outlets continue to spread hysteria instead of reasoned reporting. There are even some that still believe that governments are not doing enough and that banks and big corporations desperately wish these lockdowns to end so they can send everyone back to work to save the economy. But are we to believe then that these police enforced sanctions are only in action because the people demanded them? That governments suddenly started listening to the will of the people over big business? And where do you think that 2.2 trillion, which is $2,200 billion in aid promised by the US Senate, will end up? I very much doubt it will find itself in the pockets of small businesses and others that are hit hardest by such a global recession and I'm pretty certain the big multinationals will be left when the dust settles, unlike many of their smaller competitors. And as for the banks, who do you think is giving out the loans? Willful ignorance has overtaken many, and like all good cons, the conned, not willing to have their judgment called into question, double down and defend the con man as if it were himself. But despite my own speculation here, and whether you think this event does have the potential to kill millions, despite the questionable numbers, in the end, it boils down to one simple question. What rights and freedoms are you willing to give over to government for the notion of safety? Governments that have continued to push failed immigration policy, even willing to cover up the mass rape of tens of thousands of children to save political face and maintain their multicultural disasters. That governments during the last recession chose to bail out the banks with taxpayers' money instead of directly assisting the very same taxpaying public that were suffering because of bad banking policy? The same governments that freely allow revolving door policies to operate in sectors regarding health, thus allowing profit to dictate healthcare policy, even in government institutions? I could go on, and I am sure everyone watching this has their own personal gripes with government. But for life to exist, there must be death. And whilst the preservation of life is a noble endeavour, we must always be careful that in pursuing such a course, we do not unwittingly reduce the value of our forebears' efforts in securing us our freedoms and in doing so, so cheaply, trade them 
for the false promise of safety. What do you say to those folks who are, who are making the claim without really any evidence that these deaths are being padded, that the number of COVID-19 deaths are being padded? You will always have conspiracy theories when you have uh, very challenging public health crises. They are nothing but distractions. Conspiracy theories, doctor? So you're engaging in conspiracy theories. What do you say to Dr. Fauci tonight? Well, I would remind him that anytime healthcare intersects with dollars, it gets awkward. Right now, Medicare has determined that if you have a COVID-19 admission to the hospital, you'll get paid $13,000. If that COVID-19 patient goes on a ventilator, you get $39,000, three times as much. Nobody can tell me after 35 years in the world of medicine that sometimes those kinds of things impact on what we do. It's bad. It's not as bad as you think. It's not as bad as I think? Yeah. So it's great. I don't want to say one way or another to that. But I see on TV that, you know, it's chaos. You know what? Uh, everything you see on TV, someone I'm going to switch it up. I am on the trauma center down at uh, Kings County. That's what we're saying. Everybody who dies has coronavirus on their death certificate. Everybody who ends up having anything has coronavirus on their death certificate. And we're bringing in a bunch of people from out of town. We get doctors coming in from Nebraska who don't know what the hell they're doing. A lot of people die because of it. I don't know if it's coronavirus or if it was just a breakdown of the health system and we finally scared ourselves to shit this. It's very bizarre and I don't want to comment on it. Mr. Hutley. In your new essays, you state that these various enemies of freedom are pushing us toward a real-life, brave new world, and you say that it's awaiting us just around the corner. First of all, can you detail for us what life in this brave new world that you fear so much, or what life might be like? So it's Monday morning here in D.C. as we wake up to this brave new world. Uh, now, I, I think well, what is going to happen in the future is the dictators will find, as the old saying goes, that you can do everything with their needs except sit on them. That if you want to preserve your power indefinitely, you have to get the consent of the ruled. And this they will do, partly by drugs, as I foresaw in, uh, in Brave New World, partly by these uh, new techniques of, uh, uh, of propaganda. They will do it by bypassing the sort of rational side of man, and appealing to his uh, subconscious and his uh, deeper emotions and uh, his physiology even and so making him actually love his slavery i mean i think this is the danger that actually people may be in some ways happy under the new uh, regime when it comes to coronavirus time takes on new meaning so much is so rapidly changing it seems overwhelming almost impossible to keep up in Australia today, we are right on the edge. While COVID-19 is certainly not under control here, so far, it's not out of control. But as global health experts keep warning us, it could happen at any moment, unless we all drastically change the way we currently live.